said here. Your, it is my pleasure to uh, bring on uh, Gresham Schimantel. Am I getting it correctly? Uh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a whirl. Oh, my dear. name is Grayson Scheidemantel. Thank you. I, I, I should have asked. Um, I, I will just share a little bit about how I uh, was, how uh, her work was brought and the Institute's work was brought to my attention. Uh, since I moved to the lake about 11 years ago, right on the lake, I have been taking samples as part of a, a citizen science initiative to uh, notice the degree to which various types of color forms of pathogens are showing up in the wa very waters that we swim in and boat in. And uh, the samples are rushed up every uh, about four times during the summer to uh, Grayson's uh, Institute. So when I started thinking about citizen science initiatives, I threw my net, what I thought was wide and found out that in my own backyard, here was somebody who headed up a very important uh, local effort. And so I turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark, for inviting me. Um, I do have a short presentation for you all, so I'll share my screen. Can everybody see that okay? Yes, we got it. Okay. And Ken, would, would you go ahead and mute everybody? Right. And then uh, you'll need to come back on as the speaker and unmute yourself, okay? <laughs> okay, as you can see, um, there are words popping up at the bottom of my screen. I just included uh, closed captions just in case that is helpful to anyone. So hopefully the technology can interpret everything I'm saying uh, well today. Uh, so as Mark said, my name is Grayson Scheidemannel. I'm the executive director at the Community Science Institute here in Ithaca. I just started in this position in February and I'll become full executive director next week actually as our uh, current executive director will be retiring. Oops, okay. So today I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the Community Science Institute or CSI as we call it. I'll start by telling you about our mission and then about uh, three of our water quality monitoring partnerships, our synoptic stream and lake program, our biomonitoring program, our harmful algal bloom program. And then I'll shift into some of the outreach and education work that we do here in Ithaca and throughout the Cayuga Lake watershed. I'll talk about ways that you can support CSI's mission. And then I'll leave uh, time at the end for us to uh, go over any questions or discussion. So at CSI, our mission is to partner with community-based volunteer groups so that we can better understand and protect our local streams and lakes. And we do this by collecting and disseminating scientifically credible and importantly, regulatory quality data that can help inform sustainable management strategies. So CSI is a nonprofit. We get a decent portion of our funding from local government contracts and also our fee-for-service water testing. We operate a New York State Department of Health and EPA certified lab. This is important because this is what makes all of our data regulatory quality. It can actually help to inform management strategies. Next, we take all of the data that we collect and we put it online into a public water quality database. This database is free and available for anybody to access on our website. Later this afternoon, I'll be taking us over to the database so you can see what it looks like and how to operate it. Next, as I mentioned when I was going over our agenda for today, we have a number of volunteer water monitoring partnerships, uh, such as our harmful algal bloom program, our water quality monitoring, through we, which we do through our synoptic stream program, and biomonitoring. And finally, we do a number of outreach and education activities, including with youth and adults. So CSI works with over 250 community scientists. This is what we call the volunteers who do the monitoring with us. And they participate in our four water monitoring programs. I'm just gonna focus today on our synoptic monitoring partnership, 
our biomonitoring partnership, and our harmful algal bloom monitoring partnership today. To get an understanding of how vast our programs are, this map here on the right shows you all of the places that we sample for the different programs. So in green, or excuse me, in blue, we have our synoptic sites, which you can see on Cayuga Lake, Seneca Lake, Cayuca Lake, and Canandaigua Lake. In red, you'll see our red flag monitoring partnership, which is another form of stream monitoring that we do, which is largely throughout the southern tier. In yellow, you can see where we do our biomonitoring sampling. I'll be discussing that in more detail soon. And not represented here on the map, but along the shoreline of Cayuga Lake is where we do our harmful algal bloom monitoring. So first, let's jump into our largest program, our Synoptic Stream and Lake Monitoring Partnership. This is the biggest and the longest running program we have at CSI. We've been collecting data through our Synoptic program for well over 20 years. The goal of this monitoring partnership is to produce regulatory quality data on both stream and lake quality that can inform water resource management decisions by local governments. In this program, volunteers are assigned to a set stream or water body, and then they go out and sample that stream several times a year, all on the same day, so that we can get a snapshot of the water quality. And what they're specifically looking for are uh, nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen, pathogenic bacteria, total suspended solids, and the other analytes that you can see uh, listed here. As I mentioned, all of that data that we collect with those volunteers is uploaded onto our free online public database. And this is a really powerful resource because anybody can go and look up the water quality in the stream near them by visiting our database. As I mentioned, there's over 20 years worth of data from this program. So this is a really nice long-term data set. I'm going to take us a little detour from the PowerPoint so I can show you our database. So this is what the database looks like on the main screen. You can get here yourself by going to database.communityscience.org. And to see our stream and lake monitoring results, you can navigate to streams and lakes. And again, here's a big, beautiful map that shows you all of the places where we monitor. If you scroll down, you'll see all of the different watersheds that we monitor. Uh, we'll take a look today at the Cayuga Lake watershed. It shows you a zoomed in map where you can see all of our monitoring locations in and around Cayuga Lake. And for fun, let's just go ahead and pick a stream we'd like to look at. So um, let's take a look at Six Mile Creek. So here you can see all of the different places where we've monitored on Six Mile Creek. And then the great part is the data, right? So here you can see uh, a graph that shows all of our different sampling locations. And then whatever parameter you're interested in looking at on the y-axis here. And you can change that parameter too. So maybe temperature isn't that interesting to you, so, but you want to know about uh, phosphorus levels. You can see phosphorus levels here. In blue circles, we show base flow. So what the flow of the stream is like on a typical day. And then in the diamonds in brown, we have um, stormwater events. It's really important to collect these stormwater events because this is when the greatest amount of loading of nutrients into the lake happens. And so you can scroll through and see the average of all of the events we've done. So you can see for a uh, base flow at the wildflower preserve, we have over 51 data points just for this one sampling location. So there's lots and lots of really valuable data here. You can also, if you're interested in how one uh, area has been affected over time, so if we go to our Plain Street location on, the, on Six Mile Creek, you can see how different temp, uh, analytes have changed over time. So here is time on the x-axis here, and then the analyte you're interested in. So we could take a look at phosphorus over time, and this can help us to identify trends in the data. So I just wanted to show you what the database looked like in case you ever wanted to use it and check out water quality on a stream or a creek near you. Uh, but I'll go ahead and pop back over to, to the PowerPoint. Next, I would just like to give you an example of why this data that we collect and put on our database is so impactful. 
So one of our uh, stream monitoring groups that we work with, they call themselves Stream Watch. They've been monitoring Trumansburg Creek and Taganic Creek since 2006. And Trumansburg Creek has been an interesting location because it is the home to the Trumansburg Wastewater Treatment Plant, as some of you may know. Our volunteers have been monitoring Trumansburg Creek since 2006, and they were looking at sites both upstream and downstream of the sewage treatment plant. So I wanna show you what some of the results look like from the wastewater treatment plant and um, how CSI data has been able to inform action. So on the x-axis, we have the dates when all the samples were collected. And on the y-axis, we have the number of E. coli colonies per 100 milliliter, or basically just the E. coli levels in the water at that time. This red line at the very bottom represents the New York State Department of Health contact recreation limit for E. coli, which is 235 colonies per 100 milliliter. Now for reference, if you were at a New York State park and they had a beach on the lake, if their water exceeds 235 colonies per 100 milliliters, they're required to close the beach because the water is not considered safe for swimming. So as you can see, there are several time points throughout the monitoring period of Trumansburg Creek um, when the sewage outfall site well exceeded the contact recreation limit. And indeed, there were several instances where there were hundreds of thousands of colonies of E. coli. So obviously, this data caught our attention. So CSI met with the village of Trumansburg and the wastewater treatment plant several times between 2007 and 2012. And there were some talk about what could be done, but nothing really changed in terms of our monitoring results. So because of that, in, um, 20, in 2016, uh, CSI wrote to the DEC to let them know that this was happening, that this was a problem. And the DEC did an investigation. And as it turned out, the high E. coli levels were coming from the plant. And this was largely due to aging infrastructure of the plant. So because of that, the plant was compelled to make upgrades, uh, which they completed at the end of 2016. And we're very happy to say that Streamwatch volunteers have continued to monitor the, plant, the outfall of the sewage treatment plant since then. And E. coli levels have not exceeded those Department of Health limits since 2016. And so I really like sharing this story because it just goes to show the kind of things that our data can make happen to help protect and preserve water quality in our region. Okay, now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about another of our monitoring programs, which is our biomonitoring program. I was trained as an ecologist, so this is one of my favorite programs. The goal of this program is to determine the ecological health of streams while also educating community members about the amazing local aquatic biodiversity we have in New York State. So biomonitoring is essentially collecting and identifying samples of what are called benthic macroinvertebrates or stream insects to calculate a few different metrics. And basically this tells us whether or not a stream is a healthy place for wildlife. So when we do our biomonitoring programs, we're measuring a few things. The first is total family richness. How many different families of benthic macroinvertebrates do we find? The next is EPT richness. EPT stands for Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, and Trichoptera. Those are the insect order names for mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies respectively. And we're interested in them because they're incredibly sensitive to pollutants. So if you are in an area or in a stream that has high diversity of mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, it's a pretty good indication that it's a healthy stream. The next metric we look at is the family biotic index. And that, determ that looks at how um, sensitive or tolerant to pollution uh, different order in, excuse me, different families of insects are in the stream. The next thing that we consider is the percent model affinity. This basically said, looks at an ideal stream community. What does that look like? And how does it compare to the stream that we're sampling? And then finally, the most impactful number is our biological assessment profile, which uses a calculation that combines all of these different metrics to come up with one number that tells you how healthy uh, a stream is for uh, benthic macroinvertebrates. 
And if you're interested in seeing the results of this, they're not currently available on our stream and lake monitoring database. They will be soon, we hope. Um, but for now, you can access them on our website. We post all of our biological monitoring results. We have results all the way back from 2011. And you can easily access these by clicking on the PDFs and checking out the, uh, the different metrics that I just introduced uh, on this table here. Okay, next I'm gonna move on to our second largest uh, monitoring program, our harmful algal bloom program. So for those of you who might not be aware, harmful algal blooms have become quite an issue on Cayuga Lake in the past few years. And a harmful algal bloom itself, despite the name is not actually algae, it's cyanobacteria. And what makes these blooms so harmful is that cyanobacteria produce toxins like microcystin, um, which is a liver toxin and can be harmful to your health and can be a skin and eye irritant. So in 2018, CSI started monitoring for harmful algal blooms. And we do this in collaboration with the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network and also Discover Cayuga Lake. The goal of this program is to collect actionable data on cyanobacteria blooms so that we can protect public health and relay that bloom information and testing results quickly and efficiently to the state and the county health departments. Every week our volunteer, during the HABS monitoring season that is, our volunteers monitor their designated shoreline of Cayuga Lake and report to us whether or not they see a bloom. If they do see a bloom, they collect a sample and bring it to our lab where we're looking for a few things. First, we identify what's the major cyanobacteria genus in that sample, because there's many different genera of cyanobacteria. Next, we measure chlorophyll A to determine how dense the bloom is. And finally, we measure cyanotoxins, which are those toxins that are produced by the cyanobacteria. Um, most specifically, we focus on microcystin, although we have also in the past and in the future measure anatoxin A. Right now we're working on developing our harmful algal bloom database, but in the meantime, you can see harmful algal blooms reported on our HABS reporting page on our website. The HABS monitoring season just started last Monday, and fortunately we have not had any blooms reported so far. So this page is a little boring to show you right now, but I'm, I'm very happy about that. But if there were a bloom, you could see it on this uh, map here. If you zoom in, all these gray segments represent shoreline that are monitored by volunteers. And throughout the HAB season, you'll start to see uh, symbols pop up that will show you where blooms have been reported for that year. You can also access all of that same data in this table here. As I said, no blooms have been reported yet this year, fortunately, so um, there's nothing in this table yet, but stay tuned uh, this summer for more. Okay, so that wraps up three of our main monitoring partnerships that we do here at CSI in collaboration with our volunteers. And now I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the outreach and education initiatives that we have here at CSI. Our largest program is our 4H2O Youth Education Program. This is a really neat program where we collaborate with the local Tompkins County 4H to put on a number of uh, water-related education events for youth here. Um, in the Cayuga Lake watershed. And this year we're doing a really cool program called the Journey of Water, which basically follows water at every step. So um, last, uh, two weekends ago, uh, they had a build your own water filter event where kids worked together to build different water filters out of different materials. And then they put polluted water through it and did some problem solving. What type of filters work well, what type don't. And that was a, a really successful program. We do water quality monitoring cruises on Cayuga Lake with Discover Cayuga Lake. And we also do an event called Biomonitoring Fun where the kids get to go out and sample streams for benthic macroinvertebrates like we do in our biomonitoring program. This year, the two additions that we have are our River to Fawcett Kids Tour of the City of Ithaca Water Treatment Plant, and then also the Down the Drain and Into the Lake Kids Tour of the Ithaca Wastewater Treatment Facility. So we're really excited about these series of events and um, our, I should mention that our 4H2O program is generously supported by the Park Foundation here. 
Next, at CSI, we put out annual water bulletins, which are basically newsletters of what we found from our data in the past years. Um, we have quite a catalog of past water bulletins because we have been monitoring water quality for over 20 years. Um, so if you're interested in any of those, particularly, I, I think our fall 2021, our most recent one was, was very good. So you might like to check that out on our website. Next, we put on a number of water and community events where we invite speakers and members of the community to come and talk about specific water quality issues. This photo is from a water and community event that fo focused on harmful algal blooms. These events have been on hold for a little while because of COVID, but we're hoping to be able to restart them soon. And finally, we do a number of public presentations, just like the, this one that I'm doing right now here with all of you. So if you were inspired by the work I told you about today that CSI and our dedicated volunteers and staff do every day, there's a few different ways you can help to support our mission. Um, the first is by volunteering. We're always looking for volunteers for our stream and lake program, bio monitoring, and harmful algal bloom monitoring. As you saw on that map of Cayuga Lake, there are some parts of the shoreline that we don't have folks monitoring right now. So if you live on the lake or if you know someone who does, it could be a great opportunity to, to fill in those gaps for us. Also, if you have any specialized data analysis, fundraising, grant writing, or networking skills that you would like to contribute to CSI, you can send me an email anytime and we can figure something out together. Another way to support CSI's mission is to become a member. So we have several different membership tiers and that you can find on our website under the donate tab. Um, when you become a member, you do receive a subscription to our water bulletin and our annual report. And you also get invited to our annual volunteer symposium. And we do offer as well a discount on water testing at our certified lab here in Ithaca. So if you wanted to test your drinking water, we offer a discount for that if you're a member. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and for inviting me to join you all today. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Do you have any overlap with the Cuga Watershed uh, Network? Mm, yeah, great question. So we do collaborate with the Watershed Network on our Harmful Algal Bloom program. Um, we try to collaborate with them whenever we can. I like to think that the, the difference between our groups is we're much more about collecting the data and they're a lot more about outreach and education and informing folks about individual actions that they can take and ways that they could maybe one day use our data to inform policy. How involved are you with the Seneca Lake Bitcoin issue? Oh, the Bitcoin issue. So I have heard of it. Um, we're not currently involved with it, but I will tell you that we partner with the Seneca Lake Pure Waters Association. We have a contract with them where they do the same kind of stream and lake monitoring that we do on Cayuga Lake. Um, and they bring the samples and we test them at our certified lab. So I should ask, I will be in touch with the folks at Slipwa to see um, how that's impacting where they're deciding to do their monitoring. From, from your data, what do you think is the principal cause of the algal blooms on mm. the Lake, which are much more than they used to be in the past? Mm. Yeah, that's a really great question. So in terms of what the cause of harmful algal blooms are, it seems to be a, um, an interaction between warming waters and also runoff of nutrients into the lake. And that's not just, that's not unique to Cayuga Lake. That seems to be true ac across the board. And is there any change in farming practices or input of nutrients into the lakes over the last few years? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now the southern portion of Cayuga Lake is listed as impaired by the DEC. It's on a list called the 303D list for impaired water bodies. And once a list, once a water body is put on that list, um, they get a total maximum daily load or a management decision that's written out by the DEC. The DEC just, rev, uh, just put out that draft of their TMDL, their total maximum daily load. Um, not this spring, but the spring before um, to help 
help with the nutrient problem in Cayuga Lake, specifically phosphorus is the concern. Um, and CSI and other folks have commented on that draft decision. And so right now there's no changes happening in terms of farming practices or anything like that, but something like that is in the works. You might want to turn off your screen share. Okay. I kept it, I keep it on just in case I can refer anybody to certain slides. Uh, how many staff do you have in your institute? Yeah, we have five full-time staff and two part-time folks. I wanted to ask you your your ba your background. Uh, you were working uh, out of the country at one point. How did if I if you you did some research prior to working for this institute? So tell us a little bit about your path to this to this position. Um, sure. So I, I did do a tiny bit of research abroad, but that wasn't mostly what I did um, before this. So I just recently uh, finished my PhD at Binghamton University. And there my focus was much more on aquatic ecotoxicology. So how pollutants in the water impact aquatic wildlife. And I specifically focused on amphibians. So uh, my dissertation research was about the effects of light pollution on uh, larval amphibians. But I also did work on the effects of road salts on amphibians. And so for that, I did a little bit of research in Spain. Um, but that's my only uh, international research experience. Okay. okay, great. And how, how, did, how did CSI, how did, how did the Institute come to your attention? Hmm. Yeah. So the day that I started looking for jobs, I saw this, uh, I saw this position posted and it came to my attention. It, you know, it caught my attention because first of all, I love New York state. I moved here from Western Pennsylvania and I just love the Finger Lakes region. I love upstate New York. I love the people here. I love the landscape here and the wildlife. And so I wanted to try to find something here. And I was really inspired by this position because it was something that would allow me to use my scientific training in a way that would benefit the community, which is really important to me. Um, and especially in an area that I love so much. Right, well, that's great because when you, in outlining what the Institute is doing and your involvement with it, <clears throat> It's like talk about being in a position of leverage that you can make a difference with what you, you've got going here. So I think that's, uh, that's pretty amazing that uh, you landed this position with your passion. Yes, I agree. Yeah, great, great. It Further seems, questions? Go yeah, ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Just, go ahead, Jim. Well, you mentioned road salt. Uh -huh. That, that seems to be a, a growing issue. And is there any movement to have highway departments move away from road salt? Or is that something that uh, will just continue for the time being? Yeah, you're right. It is a, uh, an issue that's being brought more and more to folks' attention. And we are starting to see a slow and gradual rise in chloride in some of the, the streams that we monitor. So it is something that's on our radar. In terms of whether highway departments are going to start, you know, to alter their, their practices, I, I'm not sure of that yet. Um, but I can tell you from my experience working with road salt, our recommendations in terms of decreasing runoff really have mostly to do with just being smart about when it's applied. So not just throwing a bunch on the road, but doing it when it makes the most sense. And that, save, that saves the highway department's money too. So what's the influence of light pollution on your, your uh, organisms? Yeah, so here at CSI, it's not something that we measure, not yet at least. Um, oh, but your, your PhD research. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I studied larval amphibians, specifically ones that are native to New York State. So I studied wood frogs, spring peepers, and American toads. And I found that in wood frogs, it can impact their activity. Um, when there's not light pollution, they tend to show daily cycles and activity. But when there's light pollution, they're just kind of inactive the whole time. Um, we found that in spring peepers, exposure to light pollution can actually affect their skin pigmentation, um, which has the potential to influence their ecology, how they interact with visual predators, for example. 
Um, and in American toads, we found that light pollution does not affect them very much, um, which in general is very true of toads in pollution. I always say that if there was an amphibian that was going to survive the apocalypse, it will be toads. They're so <laughs> resistant and tolerant to so many different environmental changes. Uh, I'm, I'm Ken, I, I really appreciate your whole discussion today. I'm absolutely blown away by the amount of resource tools and data that you have at your fingertips. Now, I'm talking to you from an international location, one whole mile across the border into Canada, sitting on a little three acre island surrounded by water. <laughs> and uh, one of the other organizations I'm associated with is the Thousand Island Association. And uh, we focus on doing all kinds of things with respect to river safety and also the environment. And uh, I learned a lot in our, our latest magazine. And the lady who wrote the article uh, absolutely amazed me. I should feel guilty putting on lots of sunscreen and then jumping into the river. So I'd like to pass the baton over to Jana Moore, who joined us. Uh, she's a summer intern with the Thousand Islands Association, because I'll bet you she's got some questions. I'd love to have you two dialoguing. Jana. Hi, sorry, I joined late. I had a few computer problems, but I caught the tail end of the presentation. Um, but I thought it was fascinating. I, I'm currently studying environmental toxicology. So a lot of this is um, overlap for me, but yeah, I'm just enjoying the questions. I don't have any right now myself, but yeah, your area of research <clears throat> definitely interests me. Oh, you could, could you could you comment briefly on uh, the essence of your article right opposite the one I wrote for River Talk? Yeah, I wrote about um, sunscreen in freshwater ecosystems mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of research, as we know, about sunscreen in saltwater. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what I learned was through the University of Al Alberta. Um, and it was about the film that sunscreen poses and um, it affects bugs and other uh, water species from laying their eggs on top of the surface, which mm. in turn affects the food chain, um, which I thought was really interesting because up until about a month ago, I didn't really think much about sunscreen in the water. But yeah, it's just like looking into mineral options um, and then also just being smart kind of as you were talking about the road salt about mm -hmm. when you apply it, where you apply it. Like if there's, if you don't need to put it all over your body then not doing that. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, it, I, I thought about it because of your mention of light pollution, mm -hmm. the sunscreen being a UV blocker actually mm -hmm. blocks the ultraviolet that the little water fleas need and they are core mm. to the entire food chain. Mm. So, anyhow, thank you very, very much. Yeah, I'd, have... I'd love to read that article if, if you'd be able to send that to me, Jana. Yeah, absolutely. I have one question <clears throat> and uh, I don't know whether you can address it, Grayson, or the or maybe Bill Klepak has some information. Uh, about the actual incidence of human disease related to the cyanobacterium, uh, uh, how prevalent that is and how severe it uh, has been in, in, uh, in people exposed. Yeah, I'm not sure in terms of the, the epidemiology, what the, the, the rates are of contact or of folks getting ill from it. Um, I think there's been really good outreach in New York State about telling folks when you see a bloom, don't swim in it. So I think that is partly why. Um, but I'm, I'm not familiar myself of what the rates are of folks being exposed and then, then getting sick. Although there have been many reports of um, people's dogs swimming and, and not faring too well. Uh. Absolutely. Let's, let's go the other direction. I've read that one of the problems uh, in waterways is drugs taken by humans. I mean, medical drugs <laughs> that get into the water. Uh, do you monitor these in any way? 
And what do you know about their effects on aquatic living organisms? Yeah, so at CSI, we don't measure um, any kind of pharmaceuticals. Um, and that's partly because it's very expensive to do that. Um, and we just don't have the, the resources to be able to. As it turns out, I do know a little bit about the effects because that almost became uh, the topic of my PhD research was the impacts of, of pharmaceuticals on aquatic wildlife. Um, so the problem with with a lot of the pharmaceuticals is that um, a lot, oftentimes it only requires very small concentrations to have an effect. So in toxicology, folks often say the dose makes the poison and meaning that the more you have of something, the more poisonous or toxic it becomes. But with some pharmaceuticals and with some endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, we see that's not true, that even very small amounts can have a significant effect. Um, it's not something we monitor at CSI right now, but maybe someday it, it could be part of our arsenal, but not today. I love the acronym CSI. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, were you going to say something? I was just going to say I'm not familiar with any reports that are coming out of the Tompkins County Health Department about our local uh, situation with harmful algal blooms. Um, I'll see if I can find something from the CDC and other people on that uh, to see if that um, if they have some data about it. Um, and then uh, regarding the medic medications that are excreted and get into our sewage treatment plants and thereupon into our streams and lake and, and so on. As you know, there's no way that the um, water treatment plants can take those things out of our uh, drinking water. Um, an associate of mine became an endocrinologist because when he was a little boy and he had an aquarium, his dad said, well, let's, let's uh, do a little experiment here. Let's take a, a thyroid pill, mm -hmm. take a very small portion of this thyroid pill, and we'll put it in the aquarium water yeah. and, <laughs> uh, and see what happens. And then, uh, of course, it had a major effect on the growth of uh, the fishes and so on in that aquarium. And that became pivotal. He became an endocrinologist. Um, so uh, did their eyes bug out? <laughs> 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 so, um, so that's a very good point, and it leads me to uh, the question I wanted to ask. Um, one of the concerns about hydrofracking uh, in the production of uh, methane has been the uh, proprietary chemicals used in the fracking process. And the fact that some of those chemicals are endocrine disruptors and, um, and uh, therefore are, are uh, associated, have been associated with uh, issues with uh, wildlife and domestic livestock. There have been reproductive events recorded with regards to them and hydrofracking. Of the, um, the waste um, fluids that come from these hydrofracking uh, enterprises. Uh, have been dealt with in various ways, sometimes uh, not very ethically. Uh, but one of the ways in which it, uh, even in New York State, has been used, um, is my understanding, is uh, on roads for uh, in the wintertime to take care of uh, ice conditions. Mm -hmm. So I wonder is CSI, uh, in a, being aware of road salt as salt, just plain salt, um, is this on your radar screen as well, the hydrofracking cracking fluids and road surfaces? Yeah, so I'm so glad you asked about this. Um, so yes, in a few different ways. So um, back when it was thought that fracking could come to New York State before it was essentially banned, um, we, did, we do have a database full of groundwater results. We, we were testing for um, basically red flags of fracking contamination. Um, so that's a whole separate section of our database. I didn't talk about it because it's not something that we're doing that actively anymore. Basically, since the threat of fracking itself has left New York, that groundwater testing has you know, gone by the wayside. We still offer it, um, but it's not a main thing that we do very often anymore. Another way is our red flag monitoring program, which I didn't discuss today because it is also starting to, um, to wane a bit. 
is another program where we're testing surface water for indicators of um, potential uh, fracking contamination. Um, and we're looking for less of like the really nasty things, something that could be more of a, a, a red flag, if you will, hence the name of the program that there could be something bigger going on. So for example, we measure conductivity, um, which measures the amount of ions in the water. Um, if there's a if there's fracking contamination, the conductivity could go up. Now conductivity could increase from other things too. But um, it's a nice way to keep an eye on those less expensive parameters for now in surface water. And then um, for groundwater, we do have a nice baseline data set on our website. So anything, uh, it is my impression that, that the, these hydrofracking fluids have found their way into New York State on, by, uh, by um, municipal uh, departments of public works. So, um, may appear yet again on our radar screen for concern. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? We're coming past two o'clock here. Well, very good, very enjoyable and informative. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you.